And he would prefer if questions could come at the end and not sidetrack him. Yeah. Really? Oh, but if really? you have a crazy oh, question, question, then maybe. Yeah. People were asked online to vote for their favorite cat video, and 10,000 people and numerous cats came to see them. <laughs> the title of this talk uses the term Zeitgeist Phenomena. I want to explain this term by discussing the Walker Art Center Cat Video Fest, which was organized by Scott Stulen. Um, and this is an image from the second Cat Video Fest. Or actually, this is one from the second Cat Video Fest, which took place at the Minnesota State Fair because the open field at the Wafer was inaccessible during construction. And the Vid Fest at the State Fair had over 13,000 visitors. In case you're wondering, the Golden Kitty for Best Video was awarded to Grumpy. <laughs> Um, Zeitgeist is a German word, and it could be translated as spirit of the age, or sign of the times. And I want to argue that the incredible interest in cats and dogs that we see now, whether in YouTube videos, painting, sculpture, what have you, is a sign of the times. What makes this particular in interest different is that it has received more institutional, i.e. high art, backing than ever before. Stulen, the cat Midwest <coughs> organizer, has made the connection between art and cat videos very clearly. Mm, quote, cat videos do all the things compelling art should. They raise questions, challenge assumptions, anger people, and create emotional connections. This is more than a collection of cute cat videos, but rather an experiment to transform a solitary online viewing experience into a real-world social event. The Internet Cat Video Festival is a platform to use this popular content to create an unironic and genuine experience. Technical innovations are very much connected to particular zeitgeist phenomena. For example, the 19th century interest in plein air painting, which is painting outside, went hand in hand with the invention of the painting tube that made it possible for French impressionists like Claude Monet to paint outside, capturing the light at particular times of the day. And so I'm arguing that similarly, cat videos and the popularity of cat videos depends on the internet. So let us trace how critics and institutions viewed cat-related images in the past and dog-related images within the context of students' assertion that these kinds of videos are art. The critic Clement Greenberg, in 1939, published Avant-Garde and Kitsch, which was an article in which he contrasted works of modern art, such as Prague's violin and palette, which you see on the left, with art he associated with mass culture. And on the right is a Saturday Evening Post cover by Norman Rockwell. So that's what he would consider kitsch. And on the left, that is what he considers important art or avant-garde art. Okay, Green 
Greenberg championed the abstract expressionists, which included Jackson Pollock, because he saw Jackson Pollock as a painter who made work that was, quote, true to the material, end of quote, and not illustrative of anything outside the work. On the right hand side is an example of the kind of work that Greenberg would paint. It's Cassius Coolidge's 1903 cigar advertisement showing us um, dogs at poker. <laughs> so Coolidge's image of dogs playing cards was seen by Greenberg as serving the lowest <coughs> common denominator. And so that would be an example of what he would call kitsch. Postmodernism is a reaction against Greenberg's type of modernism. Postmodernism gained importance in the 1980s because it deconstructed such modernist motions or notions as truth to the medium. Postmodernism seems to mock Greenberg's modernist idea of authenticity and autonomy from mass culture. Joseph Boyce, in the 1970s, developed the idea of the social sculpture, which expanded the idea of artists trying, or expanded the idea of art, trying to replace politics by art, and having everybody embrace nature and to learn from nature. Boyce's work, even though it is also opposed to Greenbergian modernism, is not interested in the cynicism and embrace of consumerism that Kuntz's postmodernism seems to offer. And Boyce should be seen as a 70s forerunner for relational art, which is also known as relational aesthetics. Relational art tries to go beyond postmodern deconstruction and instead have art become a social practice. It's a French philosopher, Nicole Bourriot, in 1998 published a book, Relational Aesthetics, in which she was investigating the open-ended and interactive trends that he saw in the works of such 1990s artists as Rick Ritt, Tirabanija and Pierre Hughes. In relational art, the artist is seen not as the maker of an object, but rather as a catalyst <laughs> for shared experiences. Burio saw what he called relational aesthetics in terms of interactivity and DIY, do it yourself, purposely in that book, employing words associated with the internet. And that's, of course, the same thing that Scott Stulen is talking about when he's um, well, pleading for this idea that cat lit fest and cat videos are an art form. Okay, here's a work by Liam Gillick, done for the German pavilion at the 2009 Venice Biennale. Gillick one of the artists associated with relational art built a kitchen into the space, for he sees the kitchen as the site of communication. To be honest, um, I was at this German pavilion, I was at the Venice Biennale, and this kitchen did not really invite communication. Not too many <laughs> people were hanging around the counter talking about things, because it was really very spare. The cat, who we see in the circle in the right slide, um, is a stuffed cat and is a reference to the fact that Gillick often would have discussions with his cat while preparing meals. Cats and dogs have always been present in art. By using a couple of examples, let us see what they symbolize. And by the way, this is not what I mean with cats in art history. Albrecht <laughs> <laughs> Durer, in his engraving of Adam and Eve, 
Um, it's showing us Adam and Eve right before they eat from the apple of the tree of knowledge. And that act of eating from the tree of knowledge constitutes, according to the Old Testament, the first and original sin. All hell is about to break loose. Death is about to arrive in paradise, thanks to Adam and Eve and their sin of eating the apple. Notice that the cat is about to bounce on the mouse, symbolizing the arrival of death in paradise. And in Bosch's Garden of Earthly Delights, we see a depiction of sin and its consequences. And on the left panel, we can see a cat holding a mouse. And this is, of course, again, a reference to sin and death. In the central panel, we see dozens of naked figures engaging in lustful activities. One of the animals being written is a cat. So once again, a cat is associated with sin. And you can see a cat in the right slide. Okay, in this detail, from Bruegel's 100 Dutch Proverbs from 1559, a cat is used to illustrate the figure of speech called to bell a cat, which means as much as to attempt an impossible plan. And you can see that the person who's doing the belling of the cat probably hasn't and well, he knows it's going to be impossible, and he's geared up for it. He's probably expecting a lot of scratches and such. And here we see a dog in the foreground, which could symbolize the idea of fidelity. And this is why many dogs are called. Fido. And this is a Renaissance work from the early 16th century, and it's called, well, it's by Titian, and it's called the Venus of Urbino. It is most likely associated with marriage because, once again, just as we had with the double portrait of Arnolfini, we have a dog at the very end on the right. And again, symbolizing fidelity, and there's also a marriage chest in the background. And this, the 17th, this 17th century Dutch genre painting can be seen as a scene of everyday life, but it also has a moral. It criticizes women who grow old without having been mothers. Within the 17th century, patriarchal well, within the 17th century patriarchal system of Europe, the role of women was to have children and take care of the household chores. The woman is shown as an old hag. She is going against the conventional nature of things, treating a cat like a child. Some would argue that things have not changed enough, but there has been a lot of change. It has become more and more accepted for women not to have babies. Cats and dogs serve as substitutes, fulfilling emotional needs, such as companionship. The zeitgeist phenomena of cats and dogs that I am exploring in this talk could not happen without this trend. As mentioned before, the internet is also an important factor. And I should take this opportunity to also point out that this cats and dogs phenomenon is connected with industrialized nations. Um, it is by no means worldwide. The concept of pets does not exist everywhere. Cats and dogs are used by the romantics to explore deep and dark subconscious emotions. And here I have examples of works by Goya, on the left is one of these black paintings where you see a dog seemingly be, being at an abyss about to disappear. You're not quite sure what is happening with this dog. 
and there's two cats fighting in the middle image, and on the right is uh, the very famous image from the Capricos by Goya um, called The Sleep of Reason Produces Monsters. And there too you have an image of a cat. So 19th century we have an increasing interest in associating cats with things that go bump in the night. Here is Monet's Olympia from 1863, and you can see a cat on the right-hand side. And this, of course, is a reference to Titian's Venus of Urbino, but instead of a cat, or instead of a dog, Monet is showing us a cat. And instead of idealizing this female figure, Monet is showing her quite realistically, and a lot of people were complaining about Monet's work as being dirty. And of course, part of the dirtiness that people saw in this work was that the subject matter didn't seem to refer to marriage or to some sort of idealized idea of a female nude, but instead it seemed to reference prostitution because Monet called this work Olympia, and Olympia was a term that, well, it was a name that a lot of prostitutes during this time period used. Also, Monet's cat is not associated with fidelity, but rather cats during this time period were very much associated with sexuality. And I'm showing you on the right-hand side a caricature from the time period, and I like caricatures from the particular time periods that paintings are made because it tells us very much what was so shocking about this work. And notice the dark hands of um, Olympia. The caricaturist saw Olympia being very dirty because she was not idealized. Um, there wasn't a lot of shading and modeling. Um, and of course, the cat was seen as completely aggressive, which is very different from the role the dog played in Titian's Venus of Urbino. I wanted to read to you two stanzas from Baudelaire's poem, The Cat, which was published in The Flowers of Evil, a collection of poetry by Baudelaire, and Baudelaire was a friend of Manet's. When my fingers leisurely caress you, your head and your elastic back, and when my hand tingles with the pleasure of feeling your electric body, in spirit I see my woman, her gaze like your own, amiable beast, profound and cold, cuts and cleaves like a dart. Let us look at examples of cats and dogs being anthropomorphized. Um, these are drawings made in the 1650s by Le Brun, who was the first director of the French Academy. Now, according to J. Paul Trusitis, quote, Le Brun inferred human personality and faculties and animal character from a geometric analysis of the structure of the head. And Edwin Landseer is an English artist who seems to have taken Le Brun's ideas to heart. Landseer uses dogs and cats to make comments about human behavior. This is he's laying down the law, where he seems to be critiquing um, <laughs> lawmaking in England and across Europe. And this is a work that is in the Minneapolis Institute of Art. And it illustrates a fable in which a monkey uses a cat to get chestnuts out of a fire. And it's really quite brutal. I mean, if you've seen it in person. And this is a French caricature that deals with the same figure of speech, this idea of using somebody else to get chestnuts out of the fire. Uh, in this case, we have a marshal using an infantryman to do the hard work. So the idea is that in the military, the upper echelon, they are, they're fine, but the lower echelons 
have to do, like the infantry, they have to do all the hard work. And of course, within war, they are the ones who do most of the dying. Um, so here you see this figure of speech used to make a very political statement. Okay, and I wanted to show you two more examples of what I would call the anthropomorphizing trend that we see with cats and dogs in art. Uh, on the left is a work by Louis Bain called Cat with a Cigar. And on the right is Shepard Ferry's Radical Cat. This is a print that he created for a show that is, I think it's still currently going on in Los Angeles. And it's called The Cat Show. And it features more than 70 artists and more than 300 works. And here are just two examples of works that are in that exhibition right now. And so Shepard Ferry's piece was one of them. Okay, and I myself have used cats in order to make statements um, about human stupidity. Uh, here <laughs> I'm, well, I'm playing off of the idea of cats being very cute and then, actually, I didn't do this work entirely by myself. I had the concept for it, and I found all these fascinating signs that are actually used or were used by Tea Party um, participants. These were actual signs carried in Tea Party rallies in, I think it was, yeah, 2008, oh, 2009. And so, I had Margaret Ireland, a graphic design student who's graduated from MSU Mankato. Uh, she helped me create this piece to make the signs look like they're actually in the space with the cats. But cats have not only been brought into connection with sensuality and things that go bump in the night, they have also been associated with the innocence of children. And here's a work by Gauguin, and then here's Gauguin's very famous, where do we come from, where are we going? Where you see a detail shot below of a child with cats next to her. And so this is all meant to symbolize um, childhood innocence. And of course Gauguin was looking at the people of Tahiti as being innocent. It's again, well, it's this idea that's very important in the late 19th century of the quote unquote primitive, this idea of the noble savage, um, the idea that there's cultures that are different from Western civilization with its emphasis on progress, and instead these cultures live as one with nature. And so this idea of eating fruit and having cats and being in a very harmonious relationship with nature is very important for this 19th century idea, which of course also survived in the 20th and still survives today. Okay, here's a fascinating work from 1928 by Paul Clay. And Paul Clay is painting in a way that captures childhood innocence. And I wanted to just give you an example of a contemporary artist who is working with dogs in this case, and his name is William Wigman, and he is really using dogs, well, a lot of his work is anthropomorphizing, uh, where he dresses up dogs and takes these huge, enormous Polaroids of them, but there's also a lot of interesting ones, like the one on the right, where it really goes beyond anthropomorphizing. Um, here's uh, more examples where on the right hand side he seems to be turning the dog into some kind of abstract work or an, a simplification of it looks like a sculpture of a dog, something Picasso might have done. And on the left hand side, this is just a fascin fascinating way of looking at a block of wood with the dog right underneath it. <laughs> And this is, uh, these are scenes from a Wegman video called Dog Duet. And I 
recommend you to see this video and I also recommend that you watch the TED Talk uh, by Scott Stulen where he talks about what he was trying to do with the cat Witfest. Um, so in that duet, you at first can't tell why these dogs are so amazingly synchronized. They move around in complete synchronization. At the very end, a ball, a tennis ball, mm -hmm. comes toward the camera, and you realize that there was a ball off stage mm -hmm. that the dogs here were following. Mm -hmm. or they were following that tennis ball. Um, this is a work by William Wegman, which I, as being a student at University of California, San Diego, as an undergraduate, I saw these, this work being constructed. Um, it's part of a fascinating public art collection called the Stewart Collection at the University of California, San Diego. And on the right-hand side, it's a bit difficult to see, um, but see, this is supposed to be a panoramic view of La Jolla, and of course, that was done in 1987, and it's changed a lot since then. And he has a little detail here where there's a sign, and it says, instead of for lease, he spelled it for leash. S-H-E-L-L-E-A-S-A. <laughs> uh, -E and so that's, of course, a reference to his own interest in creating works that involve dogs. But it also seems to be some kind of comment or it could be read as a comment about the real estate business, and especially in California, you sort of get leashed into a lease. Because it's difficult to get out of the lease. <laughs> so it becomes a leash. And I wanted to talk about an elephant in the room. And this elephant in the room is, well, it's so huge, I really have to mention it. And the elephant is called irony. And the idea of irony is that, um, well, the elephant in the room is that all this emphasis on cats and dogs that we are seeing might simply all be a put on. It might just be a laugh at serious, well, at the expense of the serious art world. So, is this just a put-on? And I wanted to show you this work. Um, this is a video of a cat drinking milk from 2002. It was um, not projected. Uh, it's actually a high-definition huge screen. Uh, usually, this kind of screen would play advertisements. But as part of a public arts uh, project, the team Fishley and Weiss, who are very famous for a project called The Way Things Go, um, created this piece. And so if you were to walk through Times Square, you would look up and you would see a cat drinking milk. It takes a cat about 10 minutes to drink milk. And I'm assuming the cat, um, well, I'm assuming the milk was lactose free, because if it isn't, the cat's going to have a problem. <laughs> but here's a really nice quote by Hans Ulrich Oberst. Um, he says, quote, Fishley and Weiss demonstrated that irony and sincerity could not exist without each other. That indeed, there is no sincerity like irony. End of quote. So what Oberst is referring to when he says that there is nothing more sincere than irony is the concept of what I would call romantic irony. And romantic irony is different from this postmodern cynical irony that we saw, for example, with Kunz's policeman and bear. For romantic irony is much more interested in irony as a creative force and a strategy. And I wanted to give you, well, I wanted to read from this poem called 435, which is a poem by Emily Dickinson. And I think this is a very good illustration of romantic irony. Much madness is divinest sense to a discerning eye. Much sense, the starkest madness. This, the majority in this, as all prevail. Ascent, and you are sane. Demure, you're straight away dangerous and handled with a chain. 
And that's the idea that the viewer, if you are saying something against something, that you are seen as completely dangerous. Whereas if you assent, if you're okay with what's happening, you are considered sane. Whereas if you really think about it, if there's too much assenting, well then that's really not good for society at all. Okay, and myself, I'm very interested in romantic irony. I mean, it came out of my research on Kurt Schwitters, who is an early 20th century German collage artist, and this is a piece that's very close from here, right above the 410. Um, I'm interested in the romantic irony idea of juxtapositions, and it's juxtapositions that are supposed to spark your mind. So this kind of romantic irony is, again, very different from the postmodern, more cynical type of irony that doesn't seem to have this interest in creativity. And it, Beatrix Nobis uh, had written a book called Kurt Schroeder's and Romantic Irony, from, well, it was published in 1993, and she discusses Schroeder's collages in terms of the romantic dialectic between the finite and the infinite. And we see that because in this collage called the Merz Bild, also known as Sternen Bild, there's references to the eternal ideas of formal composition, but these ideas of formal composition and color played against each other, um, is, that is juxtaposed to the decay of the objects that are used. And also he calls it Sternenbild, which in German means star image. So there's kind of this reference to stars. You see circles, and these circles might remind you of heavenly bodies. But of course, you also, if you look closely, you notice that these circles are actually cans, lids, and so they're garbage. They're very much used up, and they're very much about decay. And so this is what is meant with romantic irony, is this play of the eternal and the very banal, or used up. This is another work by Fish and Weiss, uh, the same team that did the cat drinking the milk. Um, and I think it's a really good example of what I see as romantic irony. And Romantic irony, again, it's all about the meeting of the banal and the sublime. So this is a sculpture that, that is called Mr. and Mrs. Einstein, shortly after conceiving the genius Albert. And this is from a series that they did. They had about 50 sculptures with scenes like this, like Mick Jagger, uh, Mick Jagger and Keith Richards, right after composing um, Can't Get Satisfaction. Uh, so it's Things that seem banal, but then you read the text and you see, whoa, this is more than banal. Um, this was the conception of Albert Einstein, um, this amazing genius, but it's a tremendously banal scene. And so again, this is the piece by Fishley Weiss that I think is a really good illustration of this idea of juxtaposition. Um, and I wanted to show you again Oberst's quote about Fishley Weiss demonstrating that irony is actually very sincere. But of course, Oberst here is not talking about this postmodern cynical type of irony, but it's really referencing the romantic irony that started in Germany with people like um, Schlegel um, and Schelling in the 19th century. And here's some more juxtapositions. Um, on the left, of course, you have this very, well, cutesy wootsy kitty cat, and it spreads hate. Um, it's an example of a meme. A meme is, of course, an amazing internet phenomenon. Um, you hate Mondays, I hate you. And there's all kinds of things. Well, Valentine's Day, there was a lot of stuff about hate and all of that. And I think that plays off, again, of juxtaposition. Uh, you wouldn't assume a little cat being that hateful. Um, now on the right hand side, I'm showing you a work by the Dadaist artist called Marcel Duchamp. And 
Duchamp is making us think, in with this particular work, of a very different side of the Mona Lisa. We don't expect to think about this particular side of the Mona Lisa. Um, in a certain sense, you could look at this postcard from 1920 as sort of a very early mem, because there's these letters, L-H-O-O-Q, and if you read these letters in French, you try to pronounce it, um, it becomes L-H-O-O-Q, which is well, a French sentence. These letters become a sentence, and translated, well, could be something like, she has a warm ass, elle a chaud au cou, which makes you think of Mona Lisa's ass, which you're not really bound to do often. And if that wasn't enough, um, Duchamp draws a mustache on her, changing her gender from woman to male. And so this is all about juxtaposition and making us look at objects from a different point of view. Um, on the left hand side is a famous cat video that you might have seen. Um, I highly recommend it. <laughs> and I'm comparing it with a work on the right hand side by the surrealist artist Max Ernst. Um, you have to think about a surrealist like the one on the right hand side within the context of this is done after World War I. Machines had created havoc, of course, during World War I. Tanks, airplanes, what have you, created a disaster of tremendous consequence, millions of dead people. Um, and so there is this fear of the machine. But of course, Max Ernst is also, a, well, he became a member of the Surrealists, and the Surrealists are really fascinated with the subconscious and how this juxtaposition of objects could make us think in a different way. Um, make us think about the subconscious. So the surrealists want us to tap into the subconscious. And this celibus, this figure on the right hand side, looks like some sort of tank or monster. Also kind of reminds us of an elephant. Uh, but it's really off-putting because you don't know if this is a machine or if it's nature or if it's both. And in a certain sense, there's maybe a little bit of fear involved in seeing this cat scooting around chasing a duck in his shark outfit. <laughs> Here's another very famous work. This is Velasquez Las Meninas, also known as Maids of Honor from 1656. And notice that in the right foreground there is a dog and the dog is actually depicted much larger than what is supposed to be the main element of the scene. And notice in the back here, there's a mirror, and we see the king and queen of Spain. So this entire work is about Velázquez, the court painter, painting the king and queen of Spain. But it's not a portrait, it's really a genre scene. It's a scene of everyday life. And you notice this dog here, and so there is very much this idea of the banal being merged with the important. The important being, of course, the king and queen of Spain, but we see a scene of everyday life at the same time. So this is a fascinating merging of, port of a category, a portrait with the category of everyday life. And I also like this idea that the boy here is, I don't know if he's kicking the dog or just stepping on the dog. But I can see this dog in a second from now biting <laughs> the dog. So it shows you a kind of spontaneous scene at this court. OK, and I wanted to end my talk by showing work by two local artists whose work are very much part, or whose work is very much part of this zeitgeist phenomena that I was talking to you about today. Um, on the left is well, Dana Sikola's Two Are Better Than One, which of course, what she did here, uh, she's showing us her dog, Murphy. And left, he's sleeping, and on the right hand side, he seems awake, but the two parts are very much connected here. And this is of course something you see a lot in art of the past. For example, with Canova's 
Cupid and Psyche, this idea of sleeping and the idea of sleep being almost like um, a death-like state. And I wanted to show you another example of this interrelationship between death and life, which I think you see in Sikolas 2 are better than 1. Um, on the right hand side is Herman Chinino's Madonna with the Long Neck. And you see baby Jesus, but baby Jesus seems huge. Um, <laughs> baby Jesus here is actually referencing uh, Pieta. He's referencing the idea of the death of Christ. He's referencing the scene when the Virgin Mary um, has the dead Christ after Christ has been taken off the cross. The dead Christ is placed on her lap. So even though this is baby Jesus, there's already a reference to um, well, Jesus being dead, or the Pieta. And this reference is highlighted by the fact that you see a cross on this vase. See, this vase is very reflective. But instead of reflecting baby Jesus, this vase is reflecting a cross. And a cross is, of course, the symbol for Christ's sacrifice. So here you have a real fascinating interplay between life and death, which I also think you see in Sigma's work, two are better than one. And of course, MSU Mankato professor Brian Frank, he created a Facebook page that he talked to us a little bit about doing his own talk. Um, and in that Facebook page, he asks individuals to send him photos of their pets so that he can paint them. And this is just another example of an artist tapping into this communal aspect of the cat and dog zeitgeist. And again, using this idea of the Facebook, using modern technology in order to create in using modern technology in order to create a communication, to create sort of an online community. And of course the photos that are sent to Brian Frank are photos taken for, um, by the, um, well let's call them guardians, by the guardians of these cats and dogs and then Brian paints them. And by painting them he becomes part of this community. So I would very much connect that with what Scott Stulen was talking about concerning their cat bit fest. Um, and here's a work called Big Laser, uh, which is now hanging in the Capitol in St. Paul. And hopefully, Brian Frank's Big Laser will help keep Minnesota legislators in check. <laughs> and this is reminding me of the way that Lorenzetti's fresco in the city hall of Siena was supposed to remind the Siena council of what effect good government has. And so the idea there is that the council should do everything it can to make good, good decisions and create good government and you have a peaceful city because of the good government. Okay, so I hope that you sort of got this idea that with this zeitgeist, um, and I was using the term romantic irony, um, that this is a zeitgeist that is very different from previous uses of mass culture, previous uses of cats and dogs. Uh, well, think about postmodernism. Postmodernism was using um, references to mass culture as a critique of Greenbergian modernism. But I do think that we are going beyond postmodernism. I think we have left postmodernism behind, and we have left this cynical type of irony behind. So there is a need for an art form which builds consensus, and that yes, it is based on a kind of sincerity. And I think that is also part of this cat and dog phenomenon, is that there is this sort of wish for some kind of sincerity in art. And so images of cats and dogs do fulfill this. Okay, the end. Um, any questions or does the cat have your tongue? <laughs> <laughs>
nothing to do with it. <laughs> okay, fine. I'm a little bit prejudiced. Kurt, I have a question. Yes. Just a little observance. In the older works that you showed, do you, do you see any correlation with most of the cats and the female takes the female form and the dogs were more like the vital, the, the, that the males were more, had the dogs uh, fidelity and that the women were more the sinful, does that follow or? There's well, there's a lot of that, and I don't think I have to go into a lot of details, but of course there's, you know, words, figures of speech that relate cats to the gender of woman. Yes. <laughs> okay. Any other questions? Uh, I asked for something. Um, in uh, referring to an earlier class in adolescent psychology, um, I asked the professor about uh, at a good age to ins um, incorporate pets, i.e. e.g. cats, dogs, into a family environment where kids live, right? And he said, yeah, it's a good idea to incorporate pets um, somewhere around the age of six because it's a good time to um, offer kids a chance to learn empathy and um, how living creatures respond to, you know, abuse a lot of times. Um, so in your, your thesis for tonight, um, looking for an, a new um, movement of artist expression, kind of countering the cynicism of postmodernism, mm -hmm. is something that pets do in, innately, maybe, is like, it may, they make us more sensitive. They make us. Yeah, and of course, care. I would again say that another zeitgeist element that is connected with that is that with a certain amount of wealth, you're able to look at pets and have pets. Yeah. Because if you're. Well, that's what I'm saying that in other countries, you wouldn't necessarily have this emphasis on creating an emotional bond with um, cats or dogs. And of course, it's also really interesting, why do we have such emotional um, connections with cats and dogs, but not with cows, for example. We eat cows, there's no problem. But you eat a cat and people freak out. So, <laughs> I think it's because they can hold them. You can't hold a cow. You know what I'm saying? So you have like, more of a connection. <laughs> you know, cow. Like, the same size as a child. I can hold a chicken. <laughs> you can ride a horse. You can't hold a horse. You can ride 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 a horse. Well, yeah, so I mean, uh, at least um, there is a discussion about um, emotional connection and with early adolescence with pets, and it, it, I mean, we continue on in life to uh, have an extended adolescence, if you will. Um, so maybe Yeah, and that's why, I mean, I saw a lot of, I mean, with these, these zeitgeist phenomena, lots of things have to come together. You need the internet in order to get a lot of people to come to see the BitFest and all that. Um, but you also need this increasing interest in the emotional mm -hmm. relationships with pets, with cats and dogs, and I think that is also tied up with a lot of people not choosing to have children very quickly, but maybe waiting on it kind of thing. So all these things do come together and create or help create this emotional bond that you might have not had in the past. Well, plus I think there's an increase in just empathy in general, you know, I mean, even though that we might eat cows still, there's a lot more people that are becoming vegetarians and you know, questioning uh, how we treat animals, you know, just for food, and whether we should even be raising them. And so I think there's an increasing uh, empathetic awareness, you know, just in general. Yeah, I mean, there's also that, this that, that idea this of into. the world seems to be in so much trouble, right. all these hot spots, horrible things going on, that we want this kind of idea of something that is really sincere and authentic and true. 
and utopias haven't worked out very well in the constructivist <laughs> utopias of okay, after World War I, we're going to change the world and every house is going to look the same and thus there will be no nation against nation. It will just be everybody living in the same house, same kind of house, and thus everybody will be one. But those kinds of utopias have turned into horrible disasters. So I think we are still looking for utopias. And I see the utopia in relational aesthetics, and I also see it in how Scott Stulman was talking about the Cat Witfest. And even with your Facebook, um, I like I your love, dog. I love your cat, I love your dog. <laughs> Yours in large letters. Your, oh, oh, your well. not mine. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's very much about creating a community and trying to create an attachment. Or yeah, it's all a metaphor for the desire for connection. Mm -hmm. seen in the past. I mean, that's what I was showing work by Edwin Lancier, mm -hmm. where he's using cats and dogs and other animals to say a lot about humans and human relationships and societal ideas and such. And I think through the internet, it's become much larger. I mean, it's had, it has such a bigger reach than anything that Lancier could have done as a painter. Thank you. 